Um, thanks, Melissa, and to the Cancer Council for inviting um, uh, me to speak this evening. The Cancer Council does a wonderful <coughs> job at supporting our uh, families and our patients, um, so thank you very much. And I suppose I have to thank, you, thank Dr. Nick for dobbing me in on this one. He always dobs me in on, on the touchy-feely stuff. So I've included lots of touchy-feely stuff this evening, Dr. Nick. Um, so I want to just quickly say that I, this, this evening I'm going to be speaking a lot about psychosocial, uh, the psychosocial impact and not specifically psychiatric or clinical psychology um, things related to childhood cancer. And I suppose um, that's sort of out of a recognition that I play a very sort of small, well, I, I'm just one, one of very many important people on our team, uh, namely our social, work, social workers, our um, OTs, uh, liaison nurses, music therapists. Um, we all uh, work together. And I'm very fortunate to work with some very talented and skilled therapists. It's not the case in all of the hospitals in, in Australia. Sometimes there's quite a big role division between these disciplines. But at PMH, I think we are really fortunate to have people who are really experienced and skilled and can do a lot of things. So um, we're going to be speaking about that. So it's about the child in context. There can be no child without a family. I suppose that's what I want to keep in mind when I'm talking about the psychosocial impact this evening. So this is a, a little model that I borrowed from my OT colleagues. It's uh, the Canadian model of occupational performance. But I really like it because it gives uh, a really good uh, graphical representation of how um, we might experience a child who's been diagnosed with cancer um, at that particular point. So um, the triangle is the person and the different aspects of their lives, the affective, physical, cognitive, spiritual aspects of their lives. And then occupation, so yeah, what they do, what they like doing. Children have occupations, they play, they attend school, they do sport, they visit friends, play computer games, Xbox, those kinds of things, really important. Um, they like yeah, they're productive, like to have fun. And then also the wider environment of um, the context that they're in. And that might be the physical environment, the school that they attend, the area, the suburb that they grow up in, um, the society, cultural aspects. You know, are they Australian? Are they immigrants? Are they refugees? Very important. So when I was thinking about this talk, I, I found it really difficult to actually prepare because I thought, like, where do I start and where do I end and what do I put in between? I was thinking, how do I present to you what the experience of the child is? I thought possibly the best way to do that might be talking about this matrix of, um, of developmental stage and disease because I think that's crucial if you're thinking about what the psychosocial impact is of a childhood diagnosis of cancer. So you can see there are different developmental ages and the different types of, of cancer will produce a different impact. So for example, the infant who is um, born with infant ALL um, might be very, will experience will be very different to that of say a latency age child with uh, a lymphoma. And likewise, a um, an adolescent male who's diagnosed with high-risk leukemia um, will have a very particular uh, experience of their treatment and the impact of their treatment on their lives. So I thought I'd like to try and the best I can to put the voice of the child and their experience into my talk. This is a, a drawing that a seven-year-old girl, a young lady, did for me. This is her, her tumor. It's, a, I think, a pilocytic astrocytoma. I asked her to draw her tumor for me. That's all I asked, and that's what she drew me. She calls it her pukey lump. And then she went on to draw wolves and stuff. <laughs> but I thought that's just amazing, the insight that she has. So when we're thinking about the impact of childhood cancer, um, yeah, I, I have to say that we actually don't really know all that much. <laughs> I'm a bit embarrassed to say that. I think the reason for that is because um, 
the research into childhood, the psychosocial impact of childhood cancer has only just really start, started to get going. If I look back at the literature on childhood cancer from a psycho-oncological perspective about 30 years ago, it's all about how to help kids with nausea. Um, and that's changed a lot now because of the different, the new treatments, the new antiemetics. Um, nausea is not a huge big problem. It is a problem, but not a huge big problem anymore. So now what we're more concerned with is trauma um, and things like um, school attendance and very importantly the neurocognitive impacts of, of treatment. So this is um, a diagram of a model developed by some people from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Kazak and her team. Um, what they find, found is they did some research which was very interesting in that it showed that children who are being treated from cancer um, don't necessarily show any more um, psychosocial um, pathology, so to speak, than their healthy peers, which was really interesting for me. But what they did find was that there were very particular risk factors. And what they've done, tr tried to do is develop a model based on um, empirical findings that can um, screen children for risk. What they found was probably about 80% of children and families, uh, or children and families where a child is diagnosed, will go through treatment with sort of a, um, a basic level of, of care that is, um, yeah, that is given to them without too many long-term consequences. But then there will be these group, this group over here, the targeted group, where during treatment they will um, develop particular symptoms. And that might be, say, a needle phobia or an adjustment disorder with depressed mood, um, those kinds of things. And then there's this pointed, uh, pointy part of the diagram, which is the families that are high risk from the start and probably the families that would have had lots of input from psychosocial practitioners anyway. So put that together with um, trauma, and I'm going to use trauma as an, an example. There's different phases of trauma, and this, this red circle kind of represents the area that we at PMH are involved with in terms of helping families um, and children. So the peritrauma, and then, then the early ongoing and evolving responses during treatment and into sort of maintenance phase, if it's leukemia, for example. So we talk about potentially traumatic events because not all events or trauma is traumatizing. You know, we know that there's a lot of subjectivity involved with that. And then we tailor our, our, our input according to these uh, different phases. This area, the yellow circle, unfortunately it's an area where I think we need to do a lot of work on. Dr. Felicity will talk more about that. But I think because we're only reaching a stage now where we've got lots of long-term survivors, uh, we don't know much about this cohort from a psychosocial perspective yet. I think we, we're starting to learn, learn about them. And in fact, I think, Melissa, it might be quite helpful to get, uh, when you have a seminar directed focusing on adults, to get somebody from the WA Psych Psycho-Oncology Service to come and talk about adult survivors of childhood cancer and some of the psychosocial problems that they're um, experiencing. I think I really like this drawing by Escher because I think it symbolizes for me life before cancer for many families. It's nice and ordered, it's got a good pattern to it and then all of a sudden their child gets diagnosed by cancer with cancer and things just turn upside down um, and topsy-turvy. That's how they explained it to me. Just another picture, you can see when are they going to stop the, sh the, the shots, I'm sure, I'm sore. Maybe there's some blood in the big toe. <laughs> I'm lonely, I wish I was in my own bed. I don't like it here, it smells funny. It's kids. I like this quote because I, th I, I often feel for a lot of the parents um, on our ward where they have to make really difficult decisions, where they have to endure um, their children in a lot of discomfort and pain and suffering and children as well who have to go through a very difficult treatment. Sometimes I walk past the procedure room and if I didn't know it was the procedure room I'd think children were being tortured or ripped apart and there, there's so much screaming. Not all the time. So when we put all the models together we hopefully end up with a, um, the, the triangle and the traumatic stress model. We end up with a model like this that just can target 
various symptoms and presenting problems over time. So this is another drawing. Um, this is a sibling of, he at the time he was eight years old, and his sister, who was 15, was diagnosed with an osteosarcoma. This is a journey drawing. Um, this is him and his sister before uh, she was diagnosed. They're sweeping leaves in the garden. The sister's got nice long hair, brown hair. Here she's had an amputation. Look at his face, look at her face. That was him when I was talking with him about the experience. And in the future, he said he was going to have attitude, like his sister, when she was a teenager. <laughs> Very honest. So I'd like to talk about some mental health and psychosocial factors um, related to pediatric um, oncology. First of all, in the acute phase, I think what we're going to see is we're going to see things like adjustment disorders, acute stress disorders, and specific phobias, things like needle phobias. It's really interesting, in my experience, in my sort of seven years that I've worked um, at PMH, I think I can only yeah, think of one patient that was a young adolescent patient who was diagnosed with a major depressive disorder and treated with antidepressants. And that's the, the, the reason for that is we, the, there's quite a lot about this in the, in the literature that most children and adolescents will respond very, very well to psychosocial interventions. It's interesting in the United States there was a paper last year in pediatric blood and cancer about the prevalence of prescription of antidepressants in, in the pediatric and adolescent uh, oncology population. They found it was very, very high. One of the um, uh, thoughts about that was that they didn't have access to psychosocial care. During the active treatment phase, I think often what I see is anxiety disorders coming out, separation anxiety, so kids that were usually on a, that were otherwise on a normal developmental trajectory, individuating, beginning to do the things that year five would do and separate from them, all of a sudden they become very clingy, they have nightmares, they have aggressive behavior. Lots of sibling issues. All of a sudden sibling feels he or she is getting ignored. Fighting, acting out. During the, ma the maintenance phase, I think um, particularly, and this would be with our leukemic patients, School is a big problem. We are really, really encouraging of children to attend school whenever possible. And in fact, there's very, very few circumstances where children can't attend school. Um, Dr. Felicity can maybe tell you a little bit more about that. But we feel that's really, really important that kids carry on going to school as much as they can during, during treatment. We're fortunate to have lovely teachers as part of our team, and they liaise very, very closely with the children's schools. We have a, um, twice a year we have a, a school, hospital school seminar where we invite teachers from the community to come in and find out about um, treatment and how they can support children through that. Um, behavior disturbance and depression, particularly when the kids are on steroids. Okay, they turn from sweet little boys and girls to monsters sometimes. <laughs> um, all the time. So sleep, eating, big problem. And then very interesting now, some, some of my colleagues in Melbourne are doing some fantastic research on parenting styles during, during active phase treatment. And I think that's going to show some, some great results, very interesting and helpful results. Ne then end of treatment, we're looking at fear of relapse, scholastic struggles. I think that's when we're going to start seeing post-traumatic stress disorder full blown, and we do see that. Um, neurocognitive uh, impact of treatment, so things like um, memory processing. Um, unfortunately, with our brain tumor uh, patients where they've had radiotherapy, surgery, and intrathecal chemotherapy, and some of the other chemotherapy agents, uh, agents we know that that is going to impact on their general intelligence, and it gets worse over time. Then also uh, the acquired brain injuries from treatment and RT, as I said, radiotherapy. Other factors to consider. So imagine a, an infant or a mother who has an infant who's diagnosed with ALL, and um, how's that going to impact on the attachment, the, ch the, the bonding that they have with this child and the attachment that this child might develop with their mother when they're not able to be held and cuddled and have all those normal things that encourage good attachment. Vicarious trauma, I think, is a, is a big problem. We have some children, adolescents on our ward, who've experienced very distressing events 
um, on the ward and also have had um, friends that they've made through treatment die. And I think that's an incredibly difficult thing for them. I know it is. I think for a lot of our, our children, there's an existential wake, wa uh, awakening. I think a diagnosis of cancer is like pushing your developmental fast forward button and uh, becoming aware of things that other children uh, your age or adolescents your age don't, don't know and don't have to consider. Grief and loss, I've spoken about that already. Fertility and sexuality, a big issue uh, to consider. One of our lovely young men who's now finished school and at university but who was diagnosed at the age of 15 years with an osteosarcoma and was living up in Kananara. When I was speaking to him last year in, when, at, his, at his visit for follow-up, I asked him what was the most difficult thing about your treatment. He said having to go to concept and give a semen sample. Just a word about quality of life. It's the big buzzword at the moment. Um, it's very confusing. Basically, um, there's very little um, concurrence about quality of life, and I think that's because there's just so many different instruments that measure quality of life. And uh, we're slowly starting to sort out what instruments we can use in the pediatric oncology population, which ones are suitable to Australia, and which ones are going to give us the most reliable uh, results. So quality of life is a difficult one. What I do find though in, in some of those instruments is that generally parents rate their children suffering higher than the children actually rate themselves. So there's a difference in perceptions and it's really important to not just take the instruments results at face value but look into that. There's a, another little picture. This is a seven-year-old girl who was in maintenance phase uh, um, leukemia. She was on steroids. She was in a bad, bad mood. Her mum and her were having real fights, no hair. She put on lots of weight. She wasn't a happy chappy. I saw her last week, actually. She was in our clinic. She's beautiful. She's uh, now in year five. And uh, long, lovely auburn hair and big smile. Really good outcome. I thought maybe what I would do is just end with a little bit of good news. Um, this is quite a busy slide, so I won't go through it. Um, completely, but just there's been a, a, a surge in, in research about post-traumatic growth, a really interesting topic. And what they found is that with children who were diagnosed at five years or older, they report um, high levels of post, or well not high levels, they, they, they definitely report higher levels than their peers in terms of post-traumatic stress, but also higher levels of post-traumatic growth they feel that they're the richer for that experience. So there is a silver lining to this. And I think this is a fascinating area of future research because it's got to do with coping and resiliency. Also parents. So parents who've um, gone through treatment, they also report higher post-traumatic uh, post growth. Um, but it seems like that's got to do a lot with the sense of coping and um, being able to restore their, their lives and their families' lives to um, sort of a manageable level during treatment. There's the role for us as psychosocial practitioners.